Hello, nice to come to you through this medium of video uh, online. I know I've missed you all very much. Um, scripture means what it says when it says we, not to neglect the assembling of ourselves because when we, we do have to be apart for a while, certainly in our hearts we feel it and we miss each other. And uh, it's, it's, uh, we're, it, it'll make that day when we can come back together as a church family all that more special. Can't wait for it. But in the meantime, I thought what I would do is bring you the lesson for April 19th out of the uh, quarterly. And we would spend a few minutes together looking at that. And I pray, well, let's just pray right now. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time. Lord, that everyone who's, who's listening to this and watching this would hear your word, uh, not my word, but your word, and your powerful and precious message in this passage we're about to look at. In Jesus' name, amen. The passage for this week is John 2, 13 through 25. Let's start by reading that. It says, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Amen. So we see here in the second chapter of John, one of the... Uh, most, well, should I say shocking passages of scripture where you see the Jesus, the God of peace, the, the, the one that brings peace and, and, and love, and yet we see our Lord angry and deal with a righteous anger uh, that um, helps us to see the full picture of who Christ is and who our Father God is as Jesus displayed what, what the Lord God, his Father, was showing him to do, and he, he did it. And, <clears throat> and I guess let's, let's start by just picturing for a moment what's happening here. You have Jews coming from all over the known world at that time into Jerusalem for this Passover feast. It was a very important uh, celebration, a festival that would happen yearly, and th they would come from everywhere. Um, and what they're, they're going to need to do is they're gonna come, they're gonna come to the temple, they're gonna offer a sacrifice, and if you travel any distance of all, you don't want to bring the animal along with you, so typically you're going to have to buy it when you get there. It's a lot easier to carry around some money than it is an animal. And so they get there, and they buy their animal, and they can go in, and they can sacrifice for the atonement of their sins at the temple in this very holy and special place. And this would be a holy and very special time in the lives of these, of these Jews. Um, so really, if you think about it, um, what these people were doing there in the temple was a service that was needed. It was something that people, they needed to be able to buy the animal. Uh, typically, they would have Roman coins, and in order to give offering, they would need to have those exchanged into shekels, in, in, into temple money, if you would, and not come in and pollute it with Roman money. So they needed money changers to change out their currency. Um, so the service was there offered. So you ask, well, what, what's the problem here? What, what's going on? And there was obviously a problem, and the Lord saw it. And there's different theories and thoughts and about as to what that was, but let's, I think we're fairly safe to say that, that Jesus saw something going on in his father's house that should not be going on. And 
the profit motive, and even as we think about uh, stealing uh, or rob robbing or overcharging is, is another thought that, that's come up. This was about a business, or as the scripture we just read said here, it's a market. It's a place to go, sell, make money, and be in, in, in good, sh in, in, and do it really for your own personal selfish reasons um, in the wrong place, in God's house. And Jesus was not going to have that. He says, zeal for your house will consume me. There's some very important messages here in this passage of Scripture that I think that we can take away and can be a great blessing to us. Really what Jesus did was an announcement that the kind of worship practiced at the temple had become corrupt and was coming to an end. Another temple was about to be raised, praise God. This story functions as the inauguration of something new happening through Jesus that will challenge the whole system of worship at the Jerusalem temple and the religious leaders. Um, <clears throat> it is interesting that Jesus chose this very important uh, festival time when there were a lot of peop people there to do this. He didn't do it on a quiet day when there weren't that many people there. He chose a day to do this shocking thing um, in front of a lot of people and to make, to make a point. He was, in effect, eliminating access to the most essential part of the worship practices of the Jewish people. By coming in, they needed the animals, they needed to exchange the money, and he said, no, out of here, turns the tables over and says, no, out. I can't even imagine what the Jewish leaders in the temple must have thought at this time, if you think about it. Who in the world are you? Well, think about if somebody's to walk into a, a, something that we are comfortable with, that we've done for generations, and it is the righteous, in our mind, thing to do, and we're, we're coming to serve God and worship God, and here comes who knows who is this guy, and with a whip, and he's, he's, he's basically throwing people out and turning over tables and coins are going everywhere and birds are flapping their wings and flying away. What a ruckus that he caused. Well, it really, to the, them, it, it was subversive. It was sacrilegious. It, it was vandalism. Who are you? And so the way they say that in verse 18, he says, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? It's kind of like, well, who, who are you? What, what is that? What is it that you're doing? And then Jesus makes the, a, a very interesting reply to this sign. And that is in, in verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. At the time that Jesus said that, nobody really understood it. Not in a way that he meant it. Not even his disciples understood it until he was actually raised from the dead three days after he was crucified. They thought he was talking about that physical temple. And, of course, what he said was utterly ridiculous in their minds. You, you, you say you're going to destroy this, temp, destroy this temple and you'll raise it in three days and it's taken us 46 years to build it? That's absolutely ridiculous. And, and so they didn't get it. They did not get it. But that was the sign that Jesus said that would be given to them. And as crazy and as ridiculous as it seemed at the time, let's think about a couple of things. That sign will be given. It'll be given not just in Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection, where he becomes the new temple, the access to God. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute. But we also know that in 70 AD, that very temple will be destroyed. Literally, the physical temple will be gone. And yet, at that time, people couldn't even imagine that temple ever being destroyed. Do you remember the time when he was walking in Jerusalem with the, with the disciples? And the disciple says, look, Lord, look at these beautiful buildings. Look how glorious and wonderful Jerusalem is. And, oh, you know, we're so proud of our, our, our city here, the great Jerusalem. And Jesus said, there, the day is coming. There's not going to be one stone left on another here. And so, it, in other words, Jesus wasn't, didn't impress him much. And it's interesting to, to me that things that may impress us in our world, and I'm wondering, does it really impress the Lord? 
but we can be impressed with things and maybe not so much in his mind is he so impressed by it and the things that we think are so great and wonderful but really when you think about it in comparison to to the Lord to God Almighty the creator of the universe it's really nothing when you think about the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth that's coming it's it's not much and and so Jesus saw he knew that this was going to be destroyed he knew he would be crucified and he knew that he would be raised again and that's why he he says that this is the sign that you're going to have um, so he's managed to arouse the hostility of the religious authorities obviously and they're very upset with him it's interesting they didn't just grab him and arrest him I don't know why the temple police didn't just come and grab him and throw him in jail right th then but they didn't and of course we know that Jesus can walk right through a crowd of hostile people and they don't touch him we saw that at Nazareth when he went back to his hometown if it's not his time it's not his time and they they weren't they weren't going to touch him at that time because that wasn't the right time it wasn't what the father had planned to do but I think that what, what we have to get at here is that the message that the Lord wants, us, wants to speak, certainly one of them, through this, is that the day was quickly coming to an end where in order to meet God, you had to travel somewhere. In order to worship God, you had to go to a holy place to do it. In order to have your sins atoned for, you had to constantly sacrifice an animal for your sins. And so what we see here is, is just religious formality. It's just a process. It's just something you did. And Jesus is saying, I will be the new temple. When you destroy this temple, it'll be raised again in three days. And he is with us. Through the Holy Spirit, we don't have to travel. We don't have to jump through this hoop and that hoop. We don't have to sacrifice an animal because not only is he our way to the Father, but he atones for our sins. And we no longer have to bring bulls and goats and whatever animal to sacrifice anymore it's done Jesus has done it Jesus has fulfilled it and the beautiful thing is it's always with us so when we're trapped in a house during a, this time when we're not supposed to be out a lot when it's hard because we want to come to church and we want to see each other but we know the Lord's with us right where we are he is the temple of God. Do you remember when he was crucified, when he died? One of the signs that we saw was that, that veil that where the Holy of Holies was shut off. Boom! It was ripped. And God said, enter in. Enter into the Holy of Holies. Enter into my presence. Christ, my son, is made away through the perfect sacrifice, the perfect unblemished lamb. And so the Holy of Holies is not some place I have to go to in Jerusalem. It's, it's open to me, and I can come in boldly to the throne room of God through Christ our Lord. This is what Jesus was saying, and he was saying it vehemently as he threw out those money changers and the people that were selling the animals for sacrifice. But this was the message that he gave when they said, show us a sign. The temple where God can be experienced was no longer a physical edifice in a particular locale, but it is in the very person of Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. As Jesus would say to the Samaritan woman in uh, chapter 4, he said, if you'll recall, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Just think of it. 
as he spoke to this lowly, outcast Samaritan woman by the well, he made a profound statement to you, to me, to all the generations between that have heard this. Destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. It would be us being true worshipers coming to the Father in the Spirit, in truth, seeking God and not some religious formality in some holy place that was required. But wherever we want to meet God, wherever God can come and meet us, whether it's in our car, in our bedroom, at our breakfast table, we can, we can actually enter in. And we can enter in with the spirit of holiness and truth within us. Now, let's, let's think about this thought here about the signs a little longer. You know, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to all this? And Jesus performed many miracles or as the, in the Gospel of John, it's, they're called signs. And if we ask ourselves a question, why did Jesus perform signs? What was this all about? And isn't it interesting that later on in this passage, as we read, when they asked him for a sign to show his authority, he tells them, you know, well, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. But then in verse 23, he says, now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. So he did perform signs, miracles. Jesus performed signs and miracles Primarily because it was a way of bringing glory to his father and glory to himself as the son and demonstrating I am the God of the universe. I am the son of God. I am the son of man as he called himself. And as Nicodemus would say in the very next chapter in chapter 3, Nicodemus, an educated religious leader, says, hey, I know you're, you're from God. You must be from God. No one could do what you do. And not, and, not, uh, and not have come from God. And so Jesus was sh showing them that. But it was, it was so that people would see who he is and not just be fascinated by the sign itself. Do you recall when um, he had fed the people? You know, they were hungry. They'd been listening to him, to him teach. And he, and he multiplied the fish and loaves and fed them. And then the crowd just was everywhere. They're all around him. It's like he, they just thought he, they wanted to make him king, you know, throw a crown on his head and let's take him, put him on a throne. And he said to them, you know what? The only reason you're really following me is because you want to be fed. You want the food. You want the bread and you, and, and you want the fish. You want your hungry tummy filled. You're after the sign. And, and, and the lesson we need to learn here, and the way Jesus answered these Jewish leaders, the sign would be, destroy this temple, and it'll be raised in three days. This was about him, and not just being enamored by some sign, and what that, that can give us, what that miracle, oh, it healed me, or it fed me. Um, you know, I was blind, physically blind, and now I can see, and the things that were wonderful things, and Jesus did do those things out of compassion for people. But the ultimate thing is that it points to him as the son of God, as, to show who he is. And he's over there. To, you know what? He could have answered as he's turning those tables over and chasing them out with the whip. He could have said, they say, what authority do you do this? You know, you could say, well, I am, this, uh, I am the, the son of the most high God. I'm your creator. His ministry in the miracles that he did was to show us who he is so that we could come to him and worship him. And I think that explains this kind of interesting passage at the end of the section here. So let's read that and, and, and we'll, we'll wrap this up. It says, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. That's verse 23. And then verse 24, very interesting, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in 
each person. So if we, and that just as a segue really into chapter three where Nicodemus comes to him kind of in secret, don't want anybody to see me doing this kind of a thing, and, um, and, 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 and approaches Jesus. And Nicodemus believed that Jesus was a teacher who'd come from God. He'd seen the signs, as I said before. However, the reply of Jesus shows that believing in him on the basis of signs alone wasn't enough. Do you remember? Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above, born of water and the Spirit. Jesus knew what was in the hearts of, of, of us humans, and he knew that our hearts were stone, and we needed hard flesh. He knew that we needed something more than just outward signs and, 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 and religious tradition and the whole Jerusalem set up and the, the physical temple and all that was going, he, he, he needed people who would have a heart of flesh, who would have a heart after him. Indeed, the words he used is, hey, it's not enough to just, oh, Jesus, you're wonderful. You're you obviously are from God. You're a great teacher. Look at these signs you do. No, no, no. Nicodemus, Hal, say your own name. You need to be born again. You need a heart after me. You need to do what I told that Samaritan woman would happen. And that you don't have to go to Jerusalem or some hill, big tall hill in Samaria somewhere or some holy place. You need to have a heart after me. You need to be born again. Jesus indeed was overturning not just tables and not just chasing out animals. He was completely disrupting the entire religious thought of the day that we had to do this and that and this other thing and fit this mold when what he wants is to have you and me have a heart after him, to know him, to be born in his spirit, to walk in his spirit. And Jesus wants that so much for me and so much for you that he showed it by the way he went after those people in that temple who are violating his father's house because he knew there was a better way. Indeed, you destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it again. Brother and sister, he rose again three days later. He is as alive now as he was then. He, through his Holy Spirit, can live within you and me and change our hearts and give us a whole new way of knowing God and actually just walking with God and letting God live through us and knowing the peace that he brings as he lives in us. Even in times that are trying and we struggle, that peace can be there because Jesus doesn't have to go be, we don't have to go find him somewhere in some temple somewhere. We just call out to him. Say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, be near me. Jesus, bring me your peace. Jesus, use me. He hears our prayers. He's near us. He's right where we are. And he wants, he wants that fellowship with us. And he wants it. Well, how badly does he want? He wants it bad enough. When you look at what he did in that temple, that's how bad he wants it. He wasn't going to mess around. This is what I'm here to do. I'm here to save people. And I'm not here to just save them from their sins, but I'm here to bring a holiness into their life to bring a peace into the life. I'm here that they may know me and that I may, and, the, and they can walk with me and they can come boldly into the throne room of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you showed us how much you care as you drove those money changers out of your house, out of your father's house. Thank you, God, that you demonstrated how vehemently you wanted us to be able to come to your Father as we're supposed to. That you would go to the cross and indeed the temple would be raised again three days later. And we'd have access to God, the very throne room of God. 
just through this vehicle of prayer, just by reaching out to you. I thank you, God, that you've told us and you've taught us to be born again, that we need to come to you and have our hearts changed from selfishness, godlessness, and instead put a heart in us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to give us a heart, Lord, to love our neighbor as ourselves. By you living and working through us in our heart. Oh God, I pray for anyone who's listening to this right now. God, would you minister to them right where they are? And would they know your presence? And know the comfort of your presence at this moment? And know the precious gift that we've been given in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. I love you. And looking forward to meeting you and being back in church as soon as we're, it's safe to do so. God bless.